Ladies and gentlemen, Sidestrafe back with some more Insurgency, but today I've got a very special guest. You may know him as Argyle, but this is Andrew Spearin of New World Interactive, co-founder of the original mod and uh, jack of all trades in regards to Insurgency itself, I'd say, today. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks. Really uh, honored to be here. I am very excited about your title. I'm glad that you guys are really bringing this back. It does re uh, remind me a lot of the old school uh, Clancy games that I grew up with. And uh, I think uh, a lot of people are excited to hear what you guys have to say a bit more. Yep, those old school Clancy games are exactly how I started out and Jeremy as well. So we're really trying to bring that tactical element back into the modern uh, first person shooter and keep it hardcore. Awesome. Now. You wanted to show me a bit more specifics in regards to this firefight mode today, so that's what we're doing at the moment. I'm trying not to get shot in the face. It's bound to happen, though. Yeah, so we've just implemented... Uh, well, we firefight has been in the game uh, since the mod days. Uh, essentially, the original game rules are secure all the objectives to win. So in this case, we kind of put a twist to it where you start with one life. Both teams start with one life. And when you secure an objective, as it appears the insurgents are about to, your team responds. Right so on. it adds this whole other dimension to the game where you're dependent upon your teammates to go for the objectives, but you can still eliminate the other team to win. Awesome. I definitely like that uh, because I think, you know, a lot of times in games people are... Uh, not afraid to to die and, and, and any type of mode that, that adds an element of you know not being able to respawn or, or requires you to work more as a team is always uh, aces in my book. Me too. I play to have the teamwork. I don't play to blow shit up. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that uh, obviously I was commenting a lot on my last video where we were or uh, where I was playing in, in a server that's also like this one didn't have. Uh, kill text or you know uh, obviously the game you know doesn't really revolve around kill to death ratio and you know just that little element a lot of people were, were pretty surprised and shocked about you know how much it changed the game itself just that one little thing with no kill text yeah that's something that uh, the original mod really started out with um, as a default was no uh, kill text so that's something we really want to keep in the game but also we realize that a lot of people still want that to show up. So we've implemented the realism mode, which uh, we have running on the server right now. So there's a few uh, a few servers running realism. Um, usually you can find one, so that's always good. I always try to find that first. Do you find that uh, more of the community is running uh, uh, realism or, or, or the other modes? I think right now it's just the kind of default mode, uh, the non-realism mode, I guess. And uh, there's, we have another game mode called Occupy, which is basically a domination style, right. um, which I think is the default in the, in the game, in the server. So um, that's perhaps why it's being played often. But I really want this firefight to take uh, precedent over that. Um, we also have Battle and Push, which we're going to be working on. Right now, they're still... Our, since our last update, um, we implemented the moving spawns in Battle, which is a big part of that. So... As soon as the, your team secures the middle objective, usually Charlie, then um, your team will move up when they respawn. Nice. In regards to modes, uh, I've seen that they are, of course, listed on the uh, official website. But, uh, you know, are you always looking at uh, different mode ideas and, and options to add, you know, for server operators to, to customize and things like that? Definitely. Um, we do want to keep find like the sweet spot of the gameplay uh, for our level design and, and such, which I really feel that Firefight has struck finally. Um, so we are definitely open to more ideas. We, we also want to implement kind of a, a, a mode that's centered around destroying the enemy's weapon cache, whether it's um, both teams have a, a weapons cache or, or uh, one team does, one attacks, one defends. So we're looking at implementing that in the near future, I hope. Nice. Uh, as far as, uh, I, I think I'd mentioned it a little bit in my first video. I was talking about, you know, I, I love a game that doesn't stop uh, with its development. That doesn't, um, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. That keeps on going. That, that's always looking to tweak things and, and better things, no matter what it is. Whether it's something like 
oh, you know, this, this piece of art needs to change two years later or an animation or, or things. Is that where you're looking at? Is that how you feel uh, your guys and artists and programmers, uh, do you think that they're uh, open to, to working that way as opposed to perhaps, I want to say, oh, I'm down, a typical uh, developer that might stop after a certain point and be set in their way? Yeah, that's basically how we've always done things. Uh, when we've worked on the mod, um, mo many of the original mod developers are, and artists are working on the game now. So uh, we're just accustomed to that. And, and many of those same guys have gone and worked in the industry. You know, we, They work in isolation for two years, and then they finally put out the game. But we are very, very much for that kind of theory of uh, you know, implement quickly and see what works, see what doesn't work, and pivot from there. I think it's called like the lean strategy or something like that, or agile development. Right. Yeah, it's, it's just, uh, you know, when I, when I got into this, and I, I got into it a little late, of course, but uh, when I did, I was just, just really just excited for some reason. I just had that, I don't know, that old feel that I missed, and, and I was thinking immediately, you know, please keep going. <laughs> like I was, I was like, don't stop, you know? And then all of a sudden I was like, I got to get more of the word out. And, and people, I actually had heard about it from my community a lot. Of, oh, you side straight, check this out. You're going to love it. And then eventually I just gave in. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I, I just, that's why we're talking today. It's just nice to see that, uh, you guys are passionate about it. And I think that's kind of what missing. It's not just about, grabbing that paycheck because a lot of you guys you know of course have have uh you know i guess other you know jobs and things too and and you're and you're also balancing this and it's this is this is your your baby in a way right oh definitely this is a passion project um you know ever since i started working with jeremy and the mod and we kind of came together in like 2004 or something so it's been yeah. like nine years we've known each other and we've been creative partners in that sense so it's uh oh my computer's crashing never a good thing but it happens which is why the power of editing exists if need be i'll just get shot in the meantime all right ladies and gentlemen brief transition there having a little bit of technical difficulty but we soldier on so, moving on, uh, one thing I wanted to talk about, we were discussing a little bit before, actually, was the uh, some of the team features. Obviously, now we have names, nameplates on the characters, uh, because, of course, uh, even though we're, we're talking about a realistic title, it, it's difficult to decipher friend from foe, and generally speaking, uh, you know, in, in a real world situation you're going to have that awareness you're going to know who your buddies are uh and whatnot yeah well um we started out having the default variable of the uh the names turned off for realism mode but we found also that there's a tendency to have friendly fire on and still a lot of accidental team killing so in the meantime we've set the default variable to turn those name tags back on again um however the server can still turn them off so we're very much, you know, trying things out, uh, working back and forth, what works, what doesn't work. Obviously, the user experience trumps all, so if it may not be realistic to have a floating name in space, it's still, like you said, it's, it, you'll know who people are in real life, so you should know who they are in the game. Right. No, I mean, that makes total sense. Um, I mean, there were times where I was playing with a group of friends the other day, and... Uh, you know, no matter what, it's difficult. Even if you're on voice comms, it's difficult to stick together. Like, okay, who is this? Okay, crouch down so I know, or jump so I know who who it is. And um, yeah, we're this. definitely looking at implementing a, a squad system uh, back into the game. That was going to be so, my next question. Yeah, we're looking, uh, which I'd also like to tie into the voice communications and and the name tags. So uh, essentially, I mean, this is still no, it's not set in stone just yet, but. Uh, off the top of my head, what I'm thinking is um, squads could assign themselves to objectives or players could assign themselves to objectives. So we're going for Bravo now, so we'd say, okay, go for Bravo. And that would essentially form our squad of the team going for Bravo. Right. And uh, the voice comms we could use would be talking to the, the, that group of players instead of the entire team. And then we'd still, on top of that, have the, uh, the 3D voice that people seem to really love. 
right on. And also on that note, um, I should mention that we have plans on overhauling our class system. Right now, you just have the option to select light, medium, and heavy, uh, and that affects your ammunition, your stamina, and, and your speed, and all that sort of thing. But uh, we're still going to maintain like that attribute, but more in a role-based uh, system, kind of like what the mod was, where you get to choose, so I'm going to be a rifleman, um, and have that kind of equipment set based on that. Right. Are you looking at, uh, in regards to some of the, uh, the squad features, how are you thinking of laying it out? Um, obviously, one of the best examples, I guess, that's kind of nailed the squad system. We'd have to look at a game like Battlefield, but uh, are you looking at something similar where the names are all uh, the same color in this, within the squad to, to easily decipher who's, who's your friend or perhaps uh, highlighting uh, whoever's on your friend list on the server or something like that? Exactly. Yeah, I've had those same thoughts. The guys that are in your squad, and also the people that uh, tie it into Steam, you know, with your Steam friends or even, you know, common groups. So if I join a tactical realism group on Steam, then I could see those players in game distinctly. Right. Yeah, I've I've seen a couple of other Steam games do something similar to where at least if they're on your friends list, that they just get turned into a different color. Yeah, it's a huge advantage. Um, just in the visual cue of seeing like you know your friends i've got a few people in here that i have on my friends list so right. i'd always love to go and play with them oh yeah definitely what was the uh the inspiration behind uh, the setting uh we've we've obviously got what looks like you know your uh, your typical insurgents versus uh what seems like perhaps uh, Marine Corps or what you've called security now? Uh, is there a reason behind that choice? Or Well, we're looking at kind of doing different teams in different environments. Uh, we're not quite there yet with that, um, but we're kind of generally thinking having, uh, you know, the, the private military contractors fighting in Iraq, and then when you have Afghanistan levels, have that as, you know, a NATO force of some sort. Um, but we generally wanted to keep the weapons balanced, so I think that was a large part of that decision. Uh, so if you kind of tweak with the weapons, make sure it's that they're not necessarily you know Marine Corps issue weapons, but uh, giving that kind of security force uh, umbrella to work with, it gives you a lot more flexibility. Right on. In regards to some of the weapons, like are are you tailoring them after any any specific uh, uh, loadouts? Are you are you mimicking? Uh, current security forces. Uh, insurgents obviously have some rare things. Uh, the MP40 being an interesting choice. Uh, any, any, I, you know, uh, what's your thought process on, on some of those additions? I, I think Jeremy uh, chose the MP40 and and <laughs> Mosin. Uh, kind of, he's the one of the. Uh, I think pretty sure he's the founder of the original Red Orchestra mod. Um, like, you know, so it's a, kind of an homage to that. Oh, wow. Those roots and. Um, and I think that he's just a personal favorite of those weapons. Right. But uh, we definitely have plans to add weapons. I mean, that's a, that's a huge request. Uh, we conduct surveys. Um, I don't know if you've seen, if you close the game, a survey yes. will pop up. Yes. So we encourage people to take that and give their feedback. Um, and one of the most demanded features is more weapons. So our priority is the light machine guns and uh, also some grenade launcher attachments for both teams. Uh, I don't know exactly when that's going to be in. Uh, everyone always asks me that. <laughs> Every single day I play, I get that question. Yeah. So yeah. can't give you a definitive date, but I mean that's a priority, and those are in the plans, so they can look forward to that. Would you say? And then I've thought about this, and maybe even mentioned it in uh, one of my videos. Is there such a thing as too many weapons? Uh, obviously, we have games like Battlefield uh, where. There are so many weapons and so many unlocks, and, and people just get mostly addicted to the unlocking, uh, as you would in an MMO. Um, is there a point where it's like, okay, enough's enough, because let's face it, you know, a gun is a gun to a certain degree with the set amount of calibers that you could possibly choose from, you know, when's quitting time as far as your selection is concerned? Yeah, I agree that, you know, a weapon's a weapon, they're all lethal. Um, they all work in different ways, but there is there should be a limit on, you know, what we really need. Um, so we fulfill those roles, you know, we've got standard assault rifles and, you know, some rifles and sniper rifles and submachine guns. So we're going to have light machine guns coming in. 
So we don't really need each and every weapon that's out there um, and tailor them specifically to, you know, here's all the accurate attachments and the different variety of scopes. Um, you know, whatever gets the job done because, you know, this game is very much, you know, one hit, one kill in many situations. So you don't really need that kind of variety. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... I already like the fact, and I think a lot of my viewers were were interested in in seeing a game where it was like, thank goodness, I don't have to unlock. I, you know, I pay for the game and I get my guns. I mean, there's there's of course supply points, but it's not like you have to spend so many hours trying to, you know, unlock a, a, a specific piece of kit, and more so, you're just rewarded for team play with supply points. Yeah, that's something our community has told us as well. Um, I, I had proposed a system, a class and ranking system, uh, in the forums and suggested, you know, maybe there should be two tiers to certain classes. So you start as a recon class, and then uh, you, if you get like two supply or three supply, you could unlock uh, to become a sniper class. And then tying into a ranking system, so if you're, say, a level three, like a sergeant, um, after you know a certain amount of time, and achievements, then uh, you could automatically get those three supply right away and unlock those squads immediately. But a lot of people said, no, we don't want to have any unlocks or any that kind of stuff. They want everything served up immediately and have that available. So we're pretty much listening to that. Right on, nice. I, I've noticed that a lot of a lot of the big uh, games out there, it, it seems that I've seen community uh complain where if you don't have unlocks i'm not buying this game and it's strange that people become addicted to that like you know why why I'm, i've always wondered why people need that and i understand it kind of addicts people to the game in a way where oh you know i gotta keep going i gotta get this unlock it and then it maybe it makes them play longer or perhaps in some cases pay more if if there's a point where it's like hey pay for this upgrade or, or something but um I don't know. It's just refreshing to see that, you know what, sometimes the old ways are best, and those things aren't necessary. Yeah, I mean, games have shifted immensely over the past few years, especially with social networking and the free-to-play games and, you know, achievements and perks and everything. So, like you said, it is kind of refreshing to see the old way that isn't necessarily a bad thing um, in terms of serving up everything. You're just having... you pay for the game and you have it all right on yeah definitely I think that's really important to to reintroduce uh, titles like that it, it, because otherwise it just becomes a norm and then you know one guy or one developer will say oh well these guys have done this so maybe we can go back to that or maybe we can do this and yeah it's it's interesting um, the mod came out in July of 2007 and Essentially, its roots came, I mean, I, when I started a mod project, uh, it was 2002, when I was in basic training in the Canadian Army. And I was 16 years old at the time, which you can join the Canadian Army Reserves at that, at that age. And right. thought, like, wow, video games get everything all wrong. And so I started sketching in my uh, notebook when I was in the field, because you get a lot of down downtime. And uh, essentially came up with plans that eventually, you know, insurgency became. And... It released in 2007, and that was months before Call of Duty even went the modern warfare route. So since then, I mean, we're talking about, oh, I got terrible math, but like six years, I guess, uh, of mainstream shooter development that has just exploded in popularity. And, you know, I've got the Call of Duties out there, you get the Battlefields out there, multiple iterations. So there's a lot of expectations that players have um, from those games that we're kind of trying to... You know, not, not necessarily work with, but understand. And li like we have that Occupy game mode, and it's quite popular probably because it's familiar to a lot of gamers who are coming from those other games. But we definitely want to be focused on a distinct game experience that is, you know, that feels like insurgency because that's what people are paying Counter Strike for two hours and they stop, they're exhausted. And if they want to play another game, they don't want to play that same experience again. So we've got to be very mindful of giving something that's unique and can fill a gap that uh, that exists right now. And there's always been a big gap in the tactical kind of shooter uh, genre. Well, maybe not necessarily in the old uh, Tom Clancy days. That was kind of what set the tone for it. But since then, you know, everybody as shooters have gotten really advanced. I mean, 
remember in Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon, you don't even see your weapon on the screen. Oh, yeah. So, but nobody um, cared. It was like this no, gameplay exactly. is so different that it doesn't even matter. Exactly. And, but we probably all wanted a weapon. You know, like sure. eventually as we see other games, like, oh, wouldn't this be awesome? This gameplay with this engine and these weapons, you could see them and have this voice communication and all this stuff. So all those things have been brewing in our minds for years, and we just want this to be the outlet for that and, you know, consolidate the community around it. Totally. I mean, it's, uh, it, it is interesting, you know, just trying to speak about some of those old games. I'm not sure because at the time, like, I grew up on, you know, Dooms and Wolfenstein, Quake, and then we, we go into when we see uh, Spec Ops from Zombie Studios and then Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, and, and, and it was like, okay, we're going somewhere different now. But then how it's somehow changed into... Well, okay, we went somewhere different, but now we're going to go back. We're actually going to take those modern military cool guys and uh, mix it up with the gameplay that you might expect out of Quake. And it's it's strange how it's turned into that and almost become preferred in a way and t to the point where publishers are like, well, this sells. We need a Hollywood action shooter, not a, not a tactical shooter. And... You know, it's just, I'm thankful I did a tweet the other day. I was like, thank goodness for games like, uh, you know, Red Orchestra and, 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 and Insurgency showing up in this day and age because it's about time. To, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, I know what you mean. I actually, uh, I handle the Twitter account for Insurgency, and today I tweeted um, a blog post. I, I've got a terrible memory, so I don't know who posted it. Or exactly what it said, but it was the premise was you can't make something for everyone, um, so you should make something for a core group of people, and when you do that, then everyone will come to it because they will see it as that. So I think yeah, games have certainly evolved away from being for somebody and trying to be like for everyone, and they feel like you know some of the shooters are trying to get this linear cinematic experience. Or they're trying to do the open world sandbox thing, MMO type thing, and let's do a MMO zombie game, let's do an MMO fantasy game, let's do an right. MMO like insert genre here. And yep. so, um, you know, we know what works and what doesn't work in terms of what we like and taste. And tactical shooters are it, and we want to just you know keep that keep that alive, keep it going. So, we started as a mod. We we're just amateur developers and artists, you know, aspiring professionals, certainly a ton of talent there. And since then, um, you know, I was 16 when I started out and I was 21 by the time it released. And at that point I was like, okay, I'm not living in my parents anymore. I'm going to college and got to get a job and do that kind of thing. So same thing with Jeremy, you know, he went to college and now since then he's like, well, all I've really done is make games. So I going to keep doing that and insurgency has been our passion project for years and we we it kind of as we, we had to leave the project and and other people kind of took over and shifted it they wanted to make it more like a game for everyone and that kind of stuff so we want to bring back the original premise in its heyday of what insurgency was so and once we do that then we can keep moving forward you know with something new in terms of you know pushing the genre forward Definitely. What are you What are you looking at in in terms of um, uh, you know how far do you do you want it to take this? Like, what what are your dreams with this? You know, what are the things that you think wouldn't it be? You sit there and you're like, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? I wish we had more time for this. Or like, what are those things? Like, is there anything that's out of your reach? You know, is there anything that you guys talk about that's just? <laughs> I don't I don't know if we really get into that right now i mean we're so focused on what we can do you know pragmatically speaking with this game um that i mean that the time to play in the sandbox and imagine stuff that was years ago and um there was an interview that i did i forget what year maybe 2005 or something on half-life radio at the time right and just talking about like this game i had in mind maybe it was probably sooner than that um and then Listening to that and thinking like, wow, Battlefield took a lot of what I said and have made that happen. And I, <laughs> I never could have made it happen with Insurgency. But, you know, um, I'm a big fan. When I'm not playing Insurgency, I'm playing Project Reality. I think that is, you know, the closest thing where 
I have felt games need to be at. Um, right. The only issue I have with that is, you know, the the engine. It just doesn't feel good at the Ooh. at the like the weapon level. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, insurgency we have we have like the free aim type thing, and we put the iron sights are very responsive, and the leaning and all that stuff. It's, it feels very good at that level, but Project Reality, for instance, feels amazing when it comes to like operationally. You know, you've got a team; they form squads based on purpose, uh, based on assets. They really, you know, are there with a purpose. And so, my ideal game would be kind of that blended with insurgency at the ground level. Right on. I remember back in the day, the very like the for the mod. A lot of people I get suggested to play project reality and reality for battlefield 2 a lot and uh, i always have to tell people well, back in the day <laughs> i actually made their very very first trailer oh wow <laughs> <laughs> it's probably still around somewhere but it was uh uh quite a thing back then to just have you know that engine with uh with with realism and um yeah i suppose in some ways still is but you know but, you know, in regards to, to engines, you know, even talking about that, you know, how has Source been for you guys, uh, you know, still in, in, in this day and age where, where some may say that it's a bit long in the tooth? Is, does it, you know, I mean, it's actually, surprisingly enough, it's still a decent looking engine and they've managed to do a lot with it. Uh, is this the latest like, do you have access to the latest versions of it and, and whatnot? I don't necessarily know a whole lot about how that works. Yeah, we've, uh, we're using the very latest version of Source, uh, which is the same that is seen in uh, Counter-Strike Go. Um, before that, we were on the Portal 2 version. Um, but yeah, Source has been around for a long time, you know, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we went with it is because uh, the pool of talent from Half-Life uh, was immense. You know, in that mod community. So we were able to get a lot of people who knew the tools and had experience building for Half-Life that could easily do it in Half-Life 2. And so it pretty much hasn't changed much since then. Um, you know, we still use Hammer as the as a level design tool, but uh, it's all pretty much forming polygons and making art and textures. So um, I, I don't know what's in store for the next iteration of, uh, of, of the Source engine or something else that Valve does, but... Uh, Certainly, I'm a big fan of like the big, giant open world stuff. But and this certainly serves a different purpose. Um, uh, we can't do the Arma scale or the Battlefield scale maps in sure. Source, unfortunately. But um, so that's why it's very focused. A lot of our level design is quite uh, well. People could say small, but I'd say it's tight. Um, we need to kind of form the gameplay around the level design a bit better. Uh, I think Firefight has mentioned before, like hit a sweet spot. Uh, for what we have already, um, Occupy, on the other hand, is you know constant respawn, constant run down the same direction, constant get killed in the same spot. Maybe there's a spawn killer that can come across, but in Firefight, really, it's, a, it's an entirely different experience when you've got that one life game mode, and then uh, occasionally you'll get uh, a respawn and you'll come in, and it'll be a whole different experience than if everyone's coming in every 30 seconds or so. Right. Now, in regards to, I'm not again. I'm not sure how how a lot of the engine stuff works. I know generally with most developers, like let's say somebody licenses Unreal latest one version of the Unreal Engine. Well, they they have that license for a certain amount of time to the point where they're allowed upgrades for a year or something. How does it work with Source in that if Valve creates a next gen engine, or it just seems like they continue to modify this existing one, but uh, you know, let's say they make the next iteration of Source, is that something that you guys have to relicense, or are you entitled to use the next, iter you know, uh, next version of the? I don't know how it works. I actually, uh, to be honest, I don't know how it works either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I've always, I've always wondered that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we've licensed Source, so I imagine that we get uh, any upgrades that they do. Um, like I said, like we first implemented it with uh, the Portal Two engine, and since right. upgraded to CS:GO, so. Um, yeah, but it, it, it certainly hasn't been... I mean, the game that you're playing today is not the same game as the mod. Right. So the mod was built on the Source SDK uh, as a, like, a total conversion, I guess you could say. And uh, this is completely separate. We, I don't think we 
we haven't recycled any code. We haven't copy pasted. There's some art that is, I think, the, the same, uh, which is much easier to do. But we pretty much built this game up from the ground, from scratch. Yeah, nice. Uh, as far as uh, I, I know, at, at one point I think um, you had discussed uh, levels in, in terms of uh, polish. Uh, I know I looked at uh, some of them, and, and obviously some seem a little bit more complete than others. Uh, are you just kind of uh, going through the you know through the alpha and saying, all right, well this this alpha's uh, this maps at this point, this percentage, and we want to add this here, and then how do you look at that in terms of complete? Are you doing one map at a time, but just throwing them in there to try to you know to break them as much as possible within the alpha, or? Yeah, well, once we have you know um, a layout, pretty much. Um, we want to get it in there and get it, people playing in it and roughly texture, that kind of stuff. Um, right now, probably the closest to saying it's completed would be Siege. Um, I don't know if we've played that yet on this video, but I could probably switch to that soon. Um, otherwise, the other ones are very rough, uh, we, we consider. And people have pointed that out. But uh, right. again, it's, it's an alpha, so um, we definitely have our priorities and our, our list of which levels we're going to release and when. So um, we do have others in the works. Um, we have plans to kind of rebuild uh, some of the mod maps, uh, namely Sinjar, which is the most popular, and, uh, and Baghdad, I think, is our other priority. Um, but again, like we can't straight port uh, one of those maps over again, so we have to rebuild it and then revisit it uh, with the new game gameplay modes and that sort of thing. Right on, totally understandable. I mean, I mean, so far, you know, it's it it seems like um, you know from a few developers that I've talked to, alphas are typically where you just add a whole bunch of things to to purposely break the game, and then and then after that, beta is more for the polish. Is that correct, generally? Yep, I think so. Uh, the way we're approaching it is alpha is the time to try out a lot of things and work towards kind of a feature complete beta. Uh, so that's pro that'll mark when we consider our game a beta will be once we've implemented, you know, the class system, the squad system, uh, a few more maps, that kind of thing. I think you've got an enemy over there on the right. Yeah, it's, it, it seems like I'm trying Behind to... The pillar. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I've got one from the... Oh. I feel like I'm taking fire oh, from the left and the right too. <laughs> I couldn't... Because I saw a tracer come from the left, but then I was looking right. Yeah. I was I was thinking about that. I'm like I'm playing. I'm like I'm doing terrible today, but I'm just gonna pretend that my excuse is the interview. <laughs> yeah, mine too. I'm actually not doing too well. Yeah, so oh, guys, I'm that's why. First, though. <laughs> I don't even have sound on, and I'm in first. So yeah, it's I, like because I've got captures. I got two captures. <laughs> I did okay like towards the end of the last map, but mm -hmm. it's not easy, guys. This isn't easy interviewing and receiving questions and giving questions and trying to kill people. Yeah. It's a whole different certification. But of course, no matter what, realistic or not, uh, at the end of the day, and I always try to deliver the message of fun, you know, I mean, it's still a game and we're just trying to uh, enjoy oh, ourselves. Yeah. yeah, if it's not fun, you're not going to play it. So um, I found the mod to be frustrating at times. So there are things, you know, that we don't want to do again that are frustrating. I think he's in that doorway on your right. Yeah, just I know the next time I I pop out. Oh. I don't know if I got him. I think you did. I, I saw think. some blood. <laughs> and with this weapon, it packs a punch. So. Yeah. Did you get the AP rounds? Uh, not yet. I always get those first because you never know when a heavy's gonna show up. Is there, you know, I hadn't taken the time to really research it myself, but is there bullet penetration through walls and whatnot in this? Uh, there are in certain materials. So if you see, like, uh, in Somebody this... Somebody shooting at me. Yeah, you're actually the last man. So if you go for an objective, Bravo or Charlie, you can get our team back and be a hero. <laughs> yeah, that would be... About to get swarmed, because they just captured one. So it's, it's all of them against you. Fantastic, but I think I'm going to get lit. See if we can get back through here, maybe. 
And you've only got four health, so one shot and you're dead. Yeah, it's not good, but... But yeah, this is what this game mode's all about, is being the last man and going for the hero cap. I've got contacts. Yeah. And they're gonna... <laughs> There's no way it's gonna happen. I'm not that good enough to pull off the, uh, the last man standing. Oh, I pulled it off a couple times last night. It's it's an amazing feeling. It's probably yeah. been the most tense experience I've had in any game, really. And, it, and I'm not biased whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. But uh, maybe I'll switch the map up to Siege uh, so you can take a look at that. That was actually where I was playing uh, last night when I had this. Um, essentially, we were down to three guys. And we all three of us met, went to the Charlie objective. Uh, and we secured it. So we got our team back. But at the same time, uh, the enemy captured Alpha, I think. So uh, they're very close to each other. So both teams were back at full strength. And I decided to defend it um, from the enemy. So I was in the security team. And so uh, I, st I stayed in there, and they, they came in a full team after me, and I dropped out four of them before they ran off. And then I pulled out and uh, went prone in behind, took out another couple guys. One guy even just stared right at me. I was out of ammo, so I pulled up my pistol and shot him in the head. And then <laughs> nice. I ran for Alpha, got into Alpha to the barber shop, and I'm behind the counter. I took out three guys trying to come in there, secured the objective, got my team back in the game, and at that point, they were down. The enemy was down to one team member left, and we just went out in the street chasing him and saw him. I took a knee and fired a burst in his back, and that was that. So we were on the verge of losing. I was the last man, but I captured the objective, got the team back and uh, won the round. So that is essentially what this game mode is all about. And that's an intensity that just can't be had in, in a lot of other titles. I mean, no respawn mechanics and certain gameplay modes, lethality of bullets. I mean, those types of stories don't... I mean, sure, there's a lot of great stuff that you can get out of any game, like Battlefield or, or COD, but... I don't know, the intensity, the heart pounding, like fe actually fearing for your life yeah. moments, I feel that yeah. I've had again in, in, in games like this. Yeah, I think it's it's the intensity and that fear comes in anticipation, in knowing that I'm the last man, it could go either way, we could win or we could lose. I'm anticipating I'm going to win and I'm going to kill this enemy, but there's always in the forefront of your mind that you're going to get shot. So, yeah, it's just in that it can't it can't be accomplished without the one kind of one life uh, you know that there's a consequence to it um, a lot of people have suggested we add uh, unlimited reinforcements just timed on a 30 second timer to this mode and I think no that destroys the entire dynamic of of this kind of depend on your team uh, which depends on the objectives and you can at least kill everybody to win or you can get all the objectives so right now we're down a few guys are about to capture Bravo and right now there's three of us are in, in that objective. So it right. really focuses the players, four now, really focuses the players on the objectives. They work together. They know that they need to in order to survive. Now, considering that I just saw it, the, the whole uh, jump up bug, let, let's kind of oh, yeah. explain that for people that don't understand why it's happening. That's As the guy just to typed too. UFO abduction. So it's yeah, a tough that's one, our, huh? <laughs> that's our UFO abduction bug, we call it. Um, it's been there since day one, pretty much. We're still working on it. It's not as bad right now, but every update, we're like, uh, we think we've solved it. Check and see. And then within five minutes of the update going live, it's like, nope, not fixed. So we're working on it. Um, a lot of people have said, no, keep it as a feature. So, what? Yeah, we're not going to do that, but uh, <laughs> we're going to solve it eventually. Ultra realistic, except for the deaths. Yeah, except for the guy shooting up, so you know that you killed him. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny the first few times, but then it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, gets a little old. Kind of takes you out of that focus on the intensity. Yeah, because you almost can't help but laugh, but... Yeah. Yeah, I think this game mode is perfect for this uh, for this layout of this map. Because you've got the big long street with the, the far stretch objective, and you've got two that are right close to each other in close quarters. So you've got to sprint across that road, and you can either cover your teammates as they go, or you can, or you can go for it yourself. And then 
you never know what enemy is going to be on the other side. But maybe you see some also sprinting in the distance. So it's right. It's a pretty good map for that. I think I'm pinned down. Oh, I'm down. I don't have sound, unfortunately. Yeah, that that's something that comes in handy in a game like this, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I always rely on listening for footsteps, especially. But yeah, as we had a technical difficulties, my computer went to sleep, so <laughs> I had to switch my uh, Skype to my phone, and therefore I don't have any sound on my computer. Yeah, that, that can definitely be painful. Uh, and uh, generally, the sounds I've actually, you know, pretty impressed uh, with, with some of the sound effects. Um, I like a lot of the level ambience that you guys have got, you know, just with the wind. I always like feeling like I'm outside, you know. Uh, yeah. Little things like that I really dig. Mm -hmm. and sound especially is key to a game like this and really putting you into that environment. My computer went to sleep again. Fortunately, it doesn't crash my game, so I get back in and I'm still in it. But, yeah, I think it's overheating. Never a good thing. Nope. Here's a MacBook, and I'm playing on boot camp windows just so I can play this game. Now, uh, I believe, is there not... Uh, oops, I almost shot at one of my own guys because I forgot that we've switched teams. Uh, this is... Is this not cross-platform uh, compatible in terms of It is. OS? Um, yeah, I was bugging our programmer for the longest time, Pongles. I said, Pongles, when is it coming to iOS? I really want to play on that. And he finally did it. And so I switched it, downloaded it, and it turns out Apple doesn't really handle games well. I mean, I'm on the exact same system, exact same hardware, and my performance dropped immensely that I just couldn't find it playable, even if I put the settings all the way down. So I just went back into Windows and back on IRC. I said, Pongles, I... So something um, <laughs> that you're still, obviously you're still, uh, your goal is to still support that, but it's, yeah. it's just still a little rough around the edges. Yeah, I yeah, I, I don't know what explains it. Maybe it's a driver thing or what, but there's certainly better Apple systems out there right now than the one yeah. I'm running on. Of Mine's course. a few years yeah, old. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, we've heard some quite positive feedback on that. We say, oh, thanks. Finally, a shooter on Apple because... I mean, Apple has exploded in popularity over the past decade or so. Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> so but uh, uh, so far, you've got you got Mac support, and then um, Linux is forthcoming, I believe, yep. right? Yep. Uh, we already support a dedicated server for Linux, and we're definitely. I think we're still waiting on Valve to do something to do with Source and Linux uh, before we can actually support that completely. Right, and and. But it currently works, uh, like somebody on uh, OS X can play with a Windows user. Yep. Yep, okay. there might be Apple people right now. I don't know. It's the exact same. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, very few games, you know, do that. And, you know, I understand the reasoning behind it, but, you know, I, I think it really does help out because... Uh, like you said, a lot of you can get some really beefy video cards in some of these newer uh, Apple machines. And yeah. I'm a user of both platforms for various reasons, and uh, I totally respect the fact that you guys have supported that. Yeah, I'm the same way. I work in the media. I've got a background in photojournalism, so using Final Cut Pro and Photoshop and all that kind of stuff on Apple is is key. Taking some five, still in this alley, the, the big old firefight alley here. We dropped a few people. Let's see if we can stay in the mix, but. Oh, oh don't even know where that, that came from. Behind you, that was me. Oh, crap. <laughs> that was the last guy. He's hanging out in Charlie. <laughs> He's about to get swarmed. Our guys are coming up. Ooh. 
any types of, uh, obviously it's, it's too early for even what I'm about to suggest, but something in regards to uh, YouTubers, uh, maybe different types of uh, spectator cameras or systems that allow for perhaps some sort of play-by-play, -play. Uh, let's say you're... I don't, I don't like to associate tactical games with tournaments and things usually, but I guess that's kind of what I have to ask in regards to some sort of uh, maybe... I don't, even, I don't even know if I've seen a Source game allow for like a, a, uh, a replay system. Or didn't they have some sort of Valve Theater or something like that? Uh, uh, you can record demos. Uh, or there's, uh, what was it, Source TV or Half-Life TV? I can't remember. I forgot what but, it was. Uh, I thought there was something. There's definitely support, you know, Valve has a lot of that um, with Counter-Strike, Dota. So um, we definitely are interested in getting something like that implemented. Um, we feel that, you know, the competitive gaming may not be associated with tactical stuff, but it could be thrilling. So we definitely want to support our own leagues and tournaments of, you know, there's already clans forming. And there's even, you know, uh, you know, tactical realism units that are coming in uh, who are very interested in the game. So. We really want to set something up for them, and um, I'm actually personally interested. I want to do a video uh, spectating a, a match of of two units, just like that, two tactical units fighting it out in this game mode in this map. You know, um, see how they play with that kind of teamwork. Um, I think that has got a ton of potential here, and it's. I don't. I don't. I'm not familiar. I haven't participated in those kind of matches in other games but i feel like our game is ripe for that definitely i mean it's you know even uh, the further along you get can be of course considered a training tool of sorts i suppose for even you know real units in regards to communication but for me it, you know it's always you know sometimes i'll find a game that's that's right in one way and has all these you know maybe spectate features but the gameplay is just not what i'm looking for and and yeah you know to, to if if the game were to have some sort of tool set or ability to um, do a better overview, perhaps even have you know a map for the spectator uh, or for the uh, the commentator at the time. You know, there's there's a whole bunch of things I suppose could be done. I was just curious if, if that's uh, something that was being looked at eventually. Yeah, yeah, eventually. I mean, our top priority right now is to iron out all the. UFO bugs and uh, of course and you know refine the weapons and get the levels all set up and that kind of stuff. So once we get you know that infrastructure in place, then we can certainly look at you know supporting the peripheral kind of stuff uh, in the, those regards. I have an idea for a spectate mode um, where you just basically run around with a camera, you know, as in in the environment. Um, maybe that's just the photojournalist in me talking, but uh, I think that'd be really fun. You know, run around a video camera and actually record it on the ground. It serves serves quite well this type of game being realistic, realistic environments, realistic uh, behavior by people to be yeah. filmed in that way um, instead of, you know, the overhead flying, well, maybe that's also realistic if you're looking at a drone, but um, you know, just the, the out of place cameras that don't make any logical sense, the real world. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's funny that's because what, I do that when I, I've filmed Airsoft in the past and I'm looking to still do that and I generally run around with a camera and I, it's, that's always what I'm doing and I'm always trying to get all these crazy angles and things. And um, Yeah. I, I, nobody's ever done that. That I would give you points for originality. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> but, I mean, uh, you probably know and, and I know from experience that that is uh, quite the engaging kind of experience. It, it's fun <laughs> to run around and you know, assess what's going on and try to capture that uh, visually and tell a story. So I think that would be kind of neat in a game. It would almost make an interesting game mode in a way if you've got like an embedded journalist who almost has a mission of his own. You know, he's, he's trying to film certain things and maybe it's a bit complex for people, but uh, you never know. There, there could be something there. <laughs> Yeah, you've just solved my life's work. <laughs> that has been in my mind for years now. That is something I actually want to pursue uh, as a game. I don't know if... It, there's a lot of secrets in the industry, but I don't know if it's one that anyone could pull off unless you know it, unless you've lived it. Um, games are very much about shooting 
And it's a form of shooting, <laughs> but it's also a yeah. form of storytelling and understanding that games are also evolving in. Um, so, but it's really hard. Uh, I read some remarks from uh, Far Cry 3, I'm not sure what his position was, creative director or something, saying that, oh, they put all these metaphors and undertones in the game to tell a story in Far Cry 3, but people <sighs> just missed it. And it's like, well, yeah, because they're focused on blowing shit up. And, and so if you're focused on actually what the story is and in an active way, which a lot of games are, you know, adventure games and kind of stuff where you go exploring the environment, Bioshock, that kind of stuff, is about, part of that is about exploration. So in figuring out what is going on, why you're here, all that stuff. So having that in this environment um, as a photojournalist embedded, you know, in a war zone, there's a, there's a lot of romantic notions in being a journalist in a war zone where maybe you're going to document something that could, you know, change the world or people's perception of what's going on. Um, right. The real world, real world instance, uh, just last week, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was a newspaper, Le Monde in France uh, sent journalists into Syria embedded with the rebels and have, you know, found evidence of gas being used against them. So right. there's been rumors and, you know, not confirmation or anything, but those journalists are out there doing important work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not easy because you're a, you're a target as well. And, uh, you know, while I don't have any real life experience, I can only I talk about the filming that I've done, you know, within the airsoft. And, and generally it's, you know, <laughs> it's it's even that's pretty creepy because it's like, well, I'm pretty, you know, I have to go out there with an armored up camera and I worry more about that than myself. But it's, uh, you know, you're in your mind that adrenaline rush uh, that thought of like wow I got to get this I got to get this footage no matter what and I can only imagine how somebody out in the real thing would feel yeah uh, well I know, I know sorry didn't want to interrupt but I know several uh, photographers friends of mine who have been to Afghanistan multiple times and um, as I mentioned I was in the military in the Canadian Army so I have friends right. who have also been to Afghanistan in a combat sense and um, the closest I've been to a war zone is Kosovo um, but it wasn't I mean, it was still uh, NATO mission was still there. I was there to document what's going on uh, prior to the independence, but uh, that's close to action. I I've been. Um, right. I didn't deploy in the military. I almost did. Um, I was in the infantry, but it came to a point where my my family is very much against the idea, and uh, it came to that point where it's okay. Do I go to college or do I go to Afghanistan? So of course. Um, <laughs> I took. Uh, took that route instead and, and still maintain my interest. I took photojournalism in school and, um, uh, you know, un unfortunately the reality is caught up to me of, of the war where uh, I was, where I went to college is 20 minutes down the road from the base where uh, the fallen soldiers in the Canadian Army are repatriated. So I documented a few of those um, and it was kind of, you know, personal to me because two, two of my buddies were actually killed over there. Uh, so I know what the feeling is like. Um, you know, to lose your fallen comrades, that kind of thing. So, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, in a way, I, I, I've got that military background, I've got that journalism background, and I've got the game experience. And I'm, I'm trying to blend that. Right. Uh, insurgency isn't necessarily that outlet uh, yet. Uh, it's certainly focused on, you know, the war part. Um, sure. But I think uh, in, the, in the coming years that, personally, I would like to pursue something that is more, you know, combines that sense. And, you know, any game developer can listen to this and say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do it. But, you know, you need a certain understanding. Uh, and that, that comes from actually doing it. No, of course. I mean, I totally see what you're saying. And um, it's definitely not as simple as just trying to, you know, to, to hijack an idea. It's, it's without that level of experience, that feel of being in it and or being close to it or knowing people that have done it as well. It's just, I don't, I don't think, I mean, there's things that no, at the end of the day, you know, you have everybody that's, that's willing to, you know, that wants to talk about guns and fighting and whatnot, but you know, sometimes it's just these armchair warriors, uh, you know, even in, in some cases, myself included, that just are never going to know it unless you're there. But, uh, yeah, and, yeah, it's, it comes a lot of debate is, uh, over the definition of realism, especially in games and, a lot of people think you know it's it's how the bullet drops and and make sure you have all the accurate weapons and the right scopes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, 
to me, yeah, that's all semantics, and that kind of goes without saying. But really, what I'm looking for in terms of realism is the interaction between the people and the environment. You know, it's not running solo, jumping up and down, firing on fully automatic. It's you know, sticking with your team, communicating, use a double tap, you know, shooting on semi-auto, that kind of stuff. So, and I realize that because you know, I went through the training. I trained for the war. It went through similar to airsoft, but sea munition, uh, right. where it's you know, nine millimeter plastic bullets with paint. And, it hurt uh, a lot more. They hurt, you know, you wear a full mask and, you know, a jock strap. <laughs> yeah. Some people get cut up from it, you know, in their hands. If, so you prop them through a window and they come out and their hands are all bloody because they got shot. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's brutal. So, but, you know, being in the, in the situation, even in training, is you get, a, you get a certain feeling and you can draw from that experience, that feeling, and put it into the game, you know, find it in the game. So that's what I'm really excited about this firefight mode is. There's consequence to it. There's, I've, I have a feeling of intensity that you know I felt in the back room of a cinder block building, you know, in a simunition training, uh, training uh, exercise. So uh, it's very much, you know, you need to have that in order to understand it. Yeah, I mean, you know, hearing all this, I think you know, everybody will appreciate the what you're actually bringing to the table. Uh, now, a lot of times, yes, you know, people will have uh, developers will have advisors and whatnot sometimes. But when you when you mix somebody that's just for the most part passionate about the game they're making, and then on top of that, actually brings that experience to the table, that's a good mix. And and seeing where you guys are going, I mean, just you know, have talking to you, a lot more excitement from me, and and I hope that everybody else is is getting stoked to to see you know to to watch this and to see what's to come and. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't think the excitement could grow much more than it already has. <laughs> well, there's a lot to anticipate. So, um, you know, we're we're still a low budget indie project. It's very much a passion project. Uh, I mean, we're getting a bit of cash flow now from this early access, but you know, it's a day by day situation where we need to, you know, make the game better so we can get more sales and we can keep it going. And um, I think a lot of of the uh, AAA kind of studios, you know, they have the advisors, as you said, Say, would have Medal of Honor had, you know, special forces that were in Afghanistan, but they're, they're paired up with uh, some people who have just been sitting in a game studio trying to make a, you know, the best game and think like, oh, well, wouldn't it be awesome if you blend, you know, your story with like this kind of awesome gamey thing. So that's probably, you know, how it turns out is this weird hybrid where people who are familiar with, you know, the military experiences, they see the potential in it. They they see the beautiful artwork and they see, you know, a really refined game in a certain sense, but you know, it's just missing something. It's a big debate on the forums of whether we should have a realism mode, whether we should have a casual mode, whether we should we should have a classic mode or just have one mode. So that's a big, you know, design challenge that that I've got to kind of figure out and Jeremy's got to figure out. So um yeah, it's. I mean, that's why we want to open up the early access process and build the community so they can chime in and say, "Yeah, let's let's do this. Let's do it this way." So it's been great. I mean, we've we've got a lot of the old uh, mod fans back and a lot of new players, a lot of people from the other games who have been like, "Yeah, you've got what these other games are missing." So I think we're definitely on the right track, and especially oh, hammer home this firefight mode. Um, that I think it best represents the direction that we're taking. Uh, in terms of, you know, a realistic experience um, with this realism mod on, so right, they might they might get in the game and start playing Occupy and just think, oh, this is like Call of Duty, except it's got more bugs and doesn't look as good. But you know, if you hop into our co-op or into our firefight, you can see the the real direction of what's happening. Yeah, and uh, I mean that's the thing. Like I've always you always. You always see people draw comparisons between... They see Source Engine and they think Counter-Strike immediately. Oh, there's a gun in it. It's Counter-Strike and it's Source Engine. It's like, yeah. look past that. You know, the, the... I mean, think a little bit. Take 10 minutes to actually, you know, to realize what you're watching and, um, and see that there's more there. And I think that, um, you know, this is definitely a great step in the right direction. And, I mean... Honestly, you have the potential to really own the, the, the close quarter market again. And um, just because what I'm seeing here, 
you know, it just again it brought me back to the to my glory days in in a, in a tactical shooter, and uh, I'm so excited about it. And I think that a lot of my viewers saw this, and uh, they were they were like instant purchases, you know, for them too. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, this is you know things like this will be good for you as well as as just you know helping you know the community to grow and, and reach the next level and say, hey, guess what? You know, uh, you know, you you publishers out there, or whatever, you're missing out, cause uh, this stuff's still good, and, and there's a different level of intensity that can never be matched by anything else. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, when I saw that you had a look at our game and and had a look at your other videos and kind of what your channel is all about, I thought, yeah, this guy really gets it. We got to do something together, cause I mean, it's been really interesting from a, a media perspective. Um, I mean, I work in the the media in Canada uh, full time. Uh, in the newspaper business, and so I see how it's being disrupted you know, day to day, and I'm actually, you know, in a place where I'm supposed to be figuring out what to do to solve that. But uh, I, think I just got the team killed. Anyway, um, the difference between marketing Insurgency Mod uh, in 2007 and marketing this game in 2013 is entirely different, and the most stark contrast that I see is with the YouTube channels. That has been by far the most effective means that we can showcase our game the way it is and to people who really care about it and see it and understand it. So, uh, you know, we can still go for those IGN exclusives and hit a mass, you know, broad audience, or we can really target the YouTube channels, you know, work with you uh, and, and others and really spread the message of what this game is about to a, a more of a core audience that is much more likely to get the game and enjoy right. it. And, uh, you know, as, as we were discussing, you know, earlier, it, it's no secret that, uh, to me, I, I try to not do the traditional journalist uh, approach when it comes to what I do on YouTube. For me, my channel has always been an extension of my personality and the games that I just enjoy, whether I'm good at them or not. Uh, and, um, you know, for me, approaching, you know, once in a while, you know, I haven't really done too many things with developers on a regular basis or anything, but, uh, you know, for me, I've, uh, you know, of course, extended the invite to you to be able to, uh, you know, visit and uh, play and make a video with me and discuss the state of the game or, or announce things if you so choose and uh, you know I think that I'd be proud to, to help you guys out and, and get the word out a bit more if I can yeah well it's been great I mean you pretty much solved my uh, my career ambitions <laughs> you brought that out of me I wasn't gonna say anything but uh, yeah I don't know it's, it's great no there's a, it's a I mean I'm a real person and uh, I'm not you know I don't have a cue sheet below me to uh, give the marketing spiel of what we're trying to do because we're indie and it's it's perfectly aligns with you know what YouTube channels are trying to do. Or, no, not what they're trying to do, what they are doing. So it's great. Yeah, I hope we can do more. <laughs> oh, I mean, definitely. There's 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 no doubt about it. And uh, you know, to me, as I always try to tell people, I said, look, you know, developers are humans too. They breathe the same air. They're gamers. Gen well, you would hope that they're gamers. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, well, obviously that's... some... <laughs> yeah, I, I often say um, to people in game, they're like, wow, you're, you're playing the game. I'm like, yeah, I'm making it to play it. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm is not... what I want to play. This is exactly the game that I want to play. So th th that's how I want to make it. And, uh, and then they're like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this isn't like... I'm not trying to sell this. <laughs> I, I wish we could put this out for free again. I mean, the mod's out there for free still, and that won't change. But, uh, you know, it's just the necessities of having a studio and hiring good people and retaining that talent. Uh, you know, they need money as they've grown up and moved out of their parents' place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think we're hitting, I don't know, I'm not even sure since we've, we've had to split it up a bit, but we're probably over an hour, which I think is going to be fantastic for the viewers. I, I am known for my my long content but uh you know i really appreciate uh you ha having you here to discuss this game i'm sure there's a lot of things that that i've missed but you know i hope that we'll be able to uh talk about the game a lot more in the future and just as the game progresses you know go through it you know uh and and really just spread the word and, and help build the community even further so definitely hope you'll return 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, maybe we could look at co-op next or something. I don't know. Well, this game is going to evolve over the coming weeks and months, so it'd be great to uh, to revisit it every so often. Oh, definitely. And you know, I'm sure that a lot of the viewers might have some questions that they can throw down in the comments below, and I'll probably try to record some of the some of the good ones and uh, have them along for next time. And perhaps maybe even next time I won't suck as bad, but uh, <laughs> that's unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that was an epic ending. <laughs> maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. and we'll en I think we'll end it with the with the, the UFO death there. Yeah, that was pretty good. And the lovely <laughs> sunset as well. All right. But, Andrew, again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Ladies really and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you on the next one.